the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are music director Mark Allen Hilt and award-winning photographer Peter Karapetian. Composer, music director, organist, and conductor Mark Allen Hilt was born and raised in the southwest part of Kansas. He went to Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, where his organ teacher inspired him. How did she inspire you to go on in your career? Well, I should say first I went to Wichita State University in Kansas. Oh, I you had a did. very fine teacher there on the, the the faculty was great. That was in the days when state universities had lots of money and they were they had terrific faculty. Robert Town was my teacher there. Uh, and then I moved on to study with Marianne Webb at Southern Illinois University. You went specifically to be with yeah, her? Yeah, there were five oh, teachers see. that I, I was see. researching to sort of see who I wanted to study with and she was she she won out. So how how did she inspire you? Well, it was a completely different kind of teaching um, that I got from, from Marianne. It was more um, specific in a lot of ways, and it was also, we, we had talked a lot about um, uh, Baroque performance practice, which is a completely radically different way of playing the keyboard, just from the matter of physically pushing down the keys and separation of notes and all and that And we're stuff. talking about the organ. That's right, exactly. So pushing yeah. down, there's a special way to push down? Well, it's <laughs> not so much about, it's how you release it. The organ is not about weight, as you may or may not know. It's about, um, um, it's a sort of complicated way to go into it, but it's um, the, the space between the notes, yeah. how you release the key, how long that space should be, or not, not any space at all. I mean, all. it goes slowly. Yes, or fast. exactly. Whether you want the release to come up and glue to the next note or not. Uh -huh. So we totally started from the beginning with that. I, I don't know much about the organ. Mm -hmm. I do go to those organ concerts at the First Congregational yeah, Church, which are fantastic. Yeah. And have you ever played that organ? I never have. No, I've been there to concerts many times. I've been to church there many times. It's and of course the Bach Festival, which is an amazing, amazing thing. But why is their organ so fabulous? Well, they they set out, I think, to make it fabulous, for one thing. And it's, it's uh, antiphonal. If I'm not mistaken, there are four organs spaced around the church that can be played from one console or four different oh, consoles. So the pipes are all The pipes are all over. Yeah, yes, exactly. I see, I see. And they can be controlled by different, different consoles. When you finished school, um, Carbondale, mm -hmm. where did you go from there? Well, I was either going to move to New York or Chicago or Los Angeles. We had three I, choices. Yeah, <laughs> I had visited my sister out here and sort of fell in love with it. I came out to see the David Hockney Tristan with <gasps> Gwyneth Jones. I was there. Yeah, and the, the one perform well, the one performance I came out to see my <laughs> sister around Christmas time. The one performance I got out here, I got the flu on that day, and I was not able to go down to see the last oh, performance. So oh. I was, it was a real drag. You came out to see that. Well, I was visiting my sister. Yeah. yeah, I was visiting my sister, and it happened to be that performance. And I thought, great, I'm just going to see that too. That, but then I, I, I didn't. I was up at the studio with David with Hockney, yeah. and the rake yeah. on the stage was like this, Shocking. and people were falling. Yeah, <laughs> when, when it I fell, actually. Well, everybody does. Then when <laughs> I saw the revival of it a few years ago at, at the opera, I was I was not so. Not so impressed. It was. It's a very steep break. It's not friendly to singers. It looks great, but it it's wasn't. not about the singers <laughs> at all. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Now, did you start teaching when you came out here? No, I was coaching. Uh, actually, I was um, uh, working with singers, and I had a choir, a small choir, the West Hollywood Chorale, that actually we performed in in West Hollywood Park oh, on several did. occasions. Oh, you did. Oh, I'm so glad you're at our studio in uh, West Hollywood exactly, now, too. And exactly. And you were just telling us about the auditorium. I was, how exciting this auditorium is, because this is where Stravinsky and Schoenberg had many of their West Coast premieres, and Stravinsky wrote some pieces for Monday evening concerts. Before they went to the Before Bing. Before they were at Lockman at the Bing, they were here in this in this hall well, in the 40s when, uh, and 50s when Michael Tilson Thomas was at SC still. That would be in the 60s, and I think they went to the Bing in the late 70s, middle 70s, something like that? Probably around. Yeah, the, yeah. The, oh, that's fantastic. Is that great? Yeah. So, yeah, you're bringing us a little bit of history Two here. Two of our Jack around a lone star. Right. Schoenberg, that's right. And the education part of your 
career? Well, that, that I just, quite, quite frankly, sort of stumbled into. I had had private students on and off, and of course, coaching singers is a kind of uh, teaching in a way. Actually coaching their voice? Yes. Is that what? Well, they would come to me to learn a role or something, and I conducted several performances of musical theater and opera, and so I would work with the principals right. and stuff. But my teaching at Harvard-Westlake, I stumbled in quite by accident. I was hired as a pianist, and then started doing more and more, and then became oh. sort of promoted or demoted, you might say, <laughs> well, to do the orchestra. No, no, no. <laughs> I went to Westlake, and when I went oh, to great. Westlake, Excellent. Yeah. it was like girls' school, yeah. but we didn't have an orchestra. No. No. How did you feel about the merger as an alumna? Were I, you? Oh no, I don't want to go into that. Okay, I All wasn't right. very happy, but right. I think it's done really great things done for very, both very sides. Well. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and especially to know that. You can have an orchestra, yeah. and girls can be in the orchestra, That's right, exactly. and so it's a whole different That's thing. Right. What do you tell your students uh, who want to be musicians, either your private ones or the ones at Harvard Westlake? Well, you know, it's so different now than when I was their age. It's it's a completely different world. I mean, everybody says that. I mean, you know. I know we all do. But <laughs> yeah, but you, first of all, you have to really you have to really know in your heart and your and your gut that. You can't not do it. You cannot you have not to. do it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's something that is. Exactly. In fact, driven. I have a, a very fine cellist, a principal cellist in my orchestra right now, as a senior. He's just decided to go to Yale. He met his teacher there on a on a college trip and had a great lesson. And he, um, we were talking about it for a long time because he's he's very good in science and math and engineering, and he was torn between the two. You know, of course, thinking of a career. But he said, you know, um, if I just have to, and then I'll see what happens. And they that. do go together, don't they? Science, well, people always music? say that. I'm not very good at math. Not I'm <laughs> not very good at math at all, no. I'm not. They always say that. I mean, I understand the intellectual concept, but I'm not very good at math. So. I'm not good at any yeah. of it. So I really think you guys are wonderful, well, that you, you can just sit at a piano and play or conduct or whatever. And as a music director, you were the music director at Santa Monica Presbyterian. Is first that what happened? First Presbyterian in Santa Monica. Yeah, exactly. And that that's, um, how'd you get that job? Well, what I had were been, you doing? I had been playing at different churches around. I was at St. Stephen's Episcopal in Hollywood for a while when I was living up in Hollywood and working at Tower Records. And then I was at Westwood Presbyterian for a while. And then I was freelancing for a while. I went out to Palisades Presbyterian. I'm, I have nothing, I just happened to be Presbyterian churches for a while. <laughs> and um, then I subbed at First Pres in Santa Monica, and um, uh -huh. the soloist, the, the pianist and, and organist said, uh, I don't want this job anymore. Do you want it? And I said, absolutely. So, so what were your duties? Well, then I was just the organist. So I would just play the, for the services and work with the director to work with the choir rehearsals, play for the soloists, uh -huh. and, you know. And then you developed that space and developed and developed, and then a jacaranda came about. Right. With then Patrick I was then Scott. exactly my partner Patrick Scott. Then I was um, the director left, and we were sort of interim, and then I was interim for a while, and they needed to uh, decide what the Friends of Music program was going to do in the fall, and s this was in January or February or March. And how long ago? Well, we're going to have our ninth season next year. Oh, so you're yeah. nine years. The same. We're the same age as Disney Hall. We opened a couple of weeks around the time Disney Hall opened. So we can keep yeah. that in mind. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, so then, how did you, you? What was the vision that you and Patrick had? Well, um, we wanted the series to be um, more adventurous than we had seen in a lot of other series, right? Um, Friends of Music was a, a very worthwhile series. I mean, it, it had presented all kinds of music of all kinds of performers, but we wanted something um, that we hadn't seen anywhere else. Plus, we also wanted to hear the music that we had never heard live, you know. Oh, so you were selfish. We were, absolutely. We were. We decided to program like Steve Reich. We programmed clapping music on the very first program and Terry Riley in C. Oh. We had a small ensemble, and I played a Philip Glass organ piece. That's, that's what was so yeah, great. That yeah. was very interesting that you, uh, how did you, how did you get that approved, so to speak? It was a well, world. Well, we didn't really approve it. We didn't it was really a world approved. premiere, wasn't it? Or was um, it the, of, of the, of the, um, Oh, the, the glass we did last, last oh, fall. Okay. That was a different piece. Yeah. Sensational Suite. Exactly. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the Philip Glass, Einstein on the Beach, we did, we've done several glass. The organ piece called um, Mad Rush, the suite from Einstein on the Beach, which recreated. It's the five knee plays. That's what you started exactly. with. Exactly. And then last fall, we did the West Coast premiere of um, Another Look at Harmony, book four, that, for, yeah. for organ and chorus. I see. Yeah. So that was fantastic. So Thank you. So you started... Um, started doing these concerts in the sanctuary yes 
which is very comfortable, yeah. very nice. The acoustics are great. Yeah. The audience feels really, I think, um, uh, intimate with the performers. It really There's does. Not, and how yeah. many people does it hold? Well, the official rule, the official uh, is something like 510 or 15, oh. something like that. But that's really crammed in, you know. And in pews, nobody sits really close to each other. I think the most we've had there have been 400 and something. But that's you know. a lot of it's people, and you looks, still yeah. feel you it feel looks like a full empty. House. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. feels like you have a lot of space. That's right. But you feel close that's right. up. That's right. Exactly. The way it's built with that kind of a quasi wrap around, and then the musicians right. are right there on the dais. And yeah. do you conduct all of them? No. It depends on what the music is. Uh, next season, I'm conducting several pieces, but some of them I'm turning over to, to friends and, and colleagues. So it doesn't always look like, you know, one person does everything. Well, we like yeah. it when you do everything. Well, I like to do it too, but you know, so you can't do everything, not with school. Does, that, school does the well. jacaranda go out? Not yet. That's on our long-term goals, is to, is to, is to plan tours and, and, and maybe go to a short tour in Europe. We were so inspired by Southwest Chamber Music. I don't know if you've ever talked to Jeff uh, Von der Schmidt, Southwest Chamber Music no, series. I haven't. But they just did that big state-sponsored trip to Vietnam and Cambodia. A few a few seasons ago, that was just spectacular. But um, have you played in Europe before yourself? Uh, on tours with choirs, never by myself. Oh, but on tours conducting or singing? Uh, Do you sing? I did, started out singing as a little kid, but as a conductor, <laughs> you lose your voice because you're yelling over orchestras in rehearsal all the time. So you lose high notes and you gain <laughs> lots of very low notes because your vocal cords just get saggy and. Is that what, what? Why is that? It's a structure of the vocal cords. It is. Yeah. You see, um, well, it's a long physiology thing that we're not going into, but yeah. Longer, fatter vocal cords make for lower notes, and shorter, tighter vocal cords make for higher notes. And of course, you can change them by wherever you pitch, pitch your voice. Then now they're tightening and they're getting smaller. As I relax and sing the voice down here, they're long and low. And so is that what you teach your students? Is that how you teach in those kind of situations? Oh, that no, way? I don't really teach with singers anymore. No, oh, you don't? No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm an orchestra director now, so I, I don't really do much but, with singers. And then do, do you... Um, um, <laughs> when to get the the, the um, musicians on, do yeah. you pick, choose the musicians for your oh, orchestra? Yeah. Well, yes. For at school, yes, of course. Uh, my one ensemble is an auditioned orchestra. This year we had fifty-five. So they're all are they? And the one for Jack Randa are that they auditions we have, too? Yeah, no. Oh. We have um, we we are always hearing new musicians, and we have a contractor who has a very wide circle of, of musical oh, acquaintances. And so it's between the three of us, Patrick, myself, and Tim, Timothy Liu, our contractor, who is really amazing, we put together who we want to play, who we think should play what, and sing. I see, I see. Yeah. I lost the word audition. Yeah, exactly. I shall never lose it again. No, it's a bad word. Don't, don't, you don't want to remember Do not audition, audition yeah. me. Thank you, Mark <laughs> Allen. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for being with us, and thanks for being at, on this part of the show. And don't go away. We'll be back with photographer Peter Karapetian. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with Peter Karapetian, who is an award-winning photographer known internationally for his fashion, portraiture, and social documentation. His work has been featured in British Vogue, Brides, and many, many other European publications. He's worked for Associated Press International, UPI and the BBC. In other words, Peter's traveled the world. He was born in Tehran and raised in London, where he trained at the Regent Street Polytechnic School of Photography. And then he went to St. Martin's School of Art. His work has been exhibited in Los Angeles, New York City, and London. Peter, how did you decide to be a photographer? Uh, well, I think as far as I remember, I was always a photographer. <laughs> uh, uh, my dad gave me a camera when I was seven, <gasps> a 16 millimeter Bolex uh, oh. movie camera. Did you wind it? Or wind it. Wind it. Wind up <laughs> with three lenses. <coughs> and John, I made a film of us fishing. I was seven, I think seven and a half. Where was that? That was in Tehran. Where we used to go, go with to my the dad. Lake fishing every Friday. 
How great! Uh, so I'm um, no, I've, seriously, I've taken pictures as long as I remember. So you wanted to be a photographer. You went to St. Martin's, which is an art school. Uh, yes. Well, they had a very interesting course, uh, industry design, uh, art, and photography. It was a mixed and new mm -hmm. course. Uh, everything is relevant. Uh, I did th I did one and a half years, I think. In there. Wow. It was very interesting course. And ever since, um, I went to other art schools too. I you went to other art schools. Yeah. Do you think the art going to art schools, taking art classes, it helps your eye? Definitely. And what about the color? Definitely. Did uh, you always colors. shoot in color? Uh, I I have uh, had phases. Uh, I've had all black and white. I've had all color. Um, at Vogue, I had a page called Mrs. Exeter comes to town. Uh, people who were visiting um, Britain and Vogue used to invite them. Uh, so that was definitely a black and white page and they used to love it. And Vogue you do that every month? with Every the month. Ah. And Mrs. Exeter. That was my page. <laughs> you were Mrs. Exeter. <laughs> <laughs> How did you find your subject matter? Sorry? How did you find the subject matter? Uh, well, it was easy because Vogue used to invite ah. many, I don't want to name drop, but really very famous actors, actresses. Why not name drop? Uh, we love name dropping. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, believe it or not, um, people like um, from Elizabeth Taylor uh, up, whoever came to London, uh, we photographed it for the for that page and the, uh, one page interview, and, oh, and it an interview was too. Uh, very well received. At one time, Vogue stopped it, and there were <laughs> protests about Mrs. Exeter. What happened to her? That was so, great. Great idea, though. Uh, it's a it's a great idea. It was <coughs> a way of knowing the people who are in London, uh, first of all, and a bit of profile, not in depth. The th the thing that's happened to that is we're losing so much of our publications um, that, and, and you working for AP and for UP oh, yes, and BBC, yes, yes. that was part of your documentary yes. uh, uh, social. Social documentary, which I've always loved, uh, Joan. Um, I've done extraordinary travels around the world. Uh, I love people, I love places, and I love my way of prying into their lives and and how do you pry in because it's very special uh, either it's the social entrance or the portraiture also is very difficult yes well um, to do documentary uh, photography is truly an art because not only you come back uh, with stunning images but you have to do uh, you have to examine and be friends of people. That's the main thing. Yeah, you have to you get can't win there. You can use a long lens, shoot and run. That's <laughs> right. what I call shoot and run. Right. Uh, I get in there with the people, always. And in the past, we had that marvelous thing, Polaroid. Uh, I used to take a Polaroid picture. Mm. And oh, they yeah. would, they, I would give it to them as a gift. They would trust me. I would go and sit down, sit down, have meals, and they, they love the Polaroid camera. And I think, I don't know if these were Polaroid cameras. These were in Armenia. This was in Armenia, And, much and this is the guard, the, a gardener. But do you have to get someone like this person's trust before you completely, can shoot? Completely, yeah, completely. It, there's <laughs> nothing worse than pointing a camera of someone you don't know uh, with a long lens and take a portrait because you're like prying into their privacy. I don't do that. Long I lens is, long is really lens. interesting, right? Because it's like sneaking it's, up on it's them. It's sneaking up on them. Uh, you know, I, I talked to this guy. Actually, he's a um, grape grower. He was just preparing for the grapes. So Armenian. It's not true. that. I love this whole that series in Armenia. That's yes. why I wanted to show these. I think this is fantastic. Yes. Onions. <laughs> Onions. Uh, that was extraordinary because I just happened to, we were driving to go somewhere else. I was going to Garaba uh -huh. and, and on the road I see these cars with full of stuff. They're going to the market. Uh, so anyway, I had to honk and stop him because it was <laughs> impossible. So anyway, I go and introduce myself. I said, he said, why do you want to take it? What, what's so interesting? I, I know. Said, what's so look at how beautiful <laughs> it is. Anyway, 
I did the pictures. Uh, so it was very innocent, you see. I, he said, uh, Mr. Peter, if you go back to America, can you send me a Toyota oh. truck? <laughs> he said, but a spare engine, too, if you don't mind. Send you what? <laughs> send who and where. You see, it's, it's wonderful. I thought it was so innocent. Like, so intimate that so he could intimate. talk to you about So that's that. what I'm saying. This is, this is one of my favorites, because you yes. see these women along the road, the gata, don't you? Delicious. Freshly baked. I buy the gata, I eat it. Talk was this gata? This gata? This yes, gata has a dessert. Of uh, well, it looked it's like bread sweet. to me. It's, it's a sweet, but thick, quite thick. And um, when I ate it with them, and said, uh, can I please take a picture? Of course. But had I stopped the car, put the camera out there, they would have, it's insulting. Because they have big smiles, they're showing their well, wares. Well, we had a great conversation, a great time. And uh, what do you use to shoot something like this? Um, what kind of camera? Uh, I, I used then the Nikon, now it's Canon, Nikon, 35 mil. 35 millimeter. And interesting thing is, these are prints from Ektachrome. <coughs> no Photoshop, it's just scanned and reprinted. This bright? No, absolutely no. No photoshopping, nothing. It's, it's fantastic. natural. It's fantastic. This church, yeah. this Vank, is it? Yes. Uh, you know, and f yeah, <coughs> very quickly, is uh, we have forgotten actually ectochrome, but that was the Bible of co color photography. But that's film. Uh, that is film, analog. That's what I'm saying. So are you These still are using all that? Analog. Oh, that's why they're so beautiful. Um, and the color, I think you saw, it is vibrant, and <coughs> I don't have to do <coughs> photoshopping. These are on view at the Tripod Studio. Correct. In, yes. uh, on, Ma on Main, Main Street, Street Venice. in Venice. Yes. Which is a charming, I, I happened to be going to some art openings the other day, and I drove by it twice, and I saw your piece in the window, and it really shows up beautifully. Yes, you'd <coughs> be surprised how many Armenian families have stopped touring around there. They've seen the window in Armenia. Because and this is thing. in the window, and the yes. pomegranates is a big draw. Yes. What, what's the story the of the pomegranates? Uh, well, this is a village uh, I was walking around. Uh, this is someone's balcony, uh, looking <coughs> over the orchards, just heaven place. And there were pomegranates all the way on that thing. The, the lady, the, the farmer's w <coughs> uh, wife, was doing it for the kids. They're sitting on the floor and she was balancing this. So I was looking at her and talking and suddenly the whole thing fell off, <gasps> except the two. And you know what she said? I said, I like to take a picture. He said, yes, take it. Because why didn't they, I said, why didn't they fall? Because they're in love. They didn't fall. Oh, how He's cute. not amazing. I'm, I'm <laughs> They're in love. Uh, they're oh, in I love, she love said. That. The rest fell off. Oh, that's so, so great. that's the story in that. <laughs> Did, was it all in Armenian? In Armenian, yes. All with all, everything was in Armenian. Yes. So this is what we call social documentation. Yes. Right? The best. Do you write stories that go along with it, or are you um, just I doing an I oral wish, history with me? No, I wish I could I'd just memorize, make little notes. Um, uh, of this family uh, where became friends. I had breakfast with them. And so those notes and names, and if I revisit, they're always there for me. I go say hello. We, we didn't talk much about the church, but there's churches like this all over Armenia. They're all over Armenia. Well, all and over the Middle East too, right? Yes, but we have more churches than anyone um, else anywhere. Uh, well, they're, they're, they're sanctuaries, they're gigantic, they're majestic, and uh, they did a great uh, thing of protecting people. People used to run away uh, from the Turks rampaging, and they used to hide in these places, close the door, put rocks there, and they could never penetrate. Beautiful. And they have canals and all the secret canals. Most of them came out nowhere else. Oh. So they're well, sanctuaries. Canals, canals reminds me of that, <coughs> of the, the Venice pictures that yes. you took. But one thing about the, the trip to Armenia and the photographing, were you on assignment? I was on assignment, yes. You were on assignment. Yes. Where do your assignments come from, actually? Uh, well, uh, the Armenian route was, um, I did a book on Armenian costumes, which I'm, sh I'm oh sure yes, you know. Oh yes, I was going to ask you about um, that. Uh, that was um, sent to Armenia. And uh, in <coughs> the days of the 
the communist regime. They, the Spirkmuchen uh, wrote to me, that's the Arts, Arts Council then, and invited me to go to Armenia. Oh, how great. Um, so then I had the, the reconnaissance, then I went back to England, and then this was the second trip uh, after the fall, so there was a big gap. Um, but I'm determined to finish it uh, the oh, way so I want to do it, uh, continue it. It is not an easy place to photograph. Uh, the distances are all by horse or mm. uh, by walking, miles carrying equipment. It's, not, it's very difficult. And the very harsh seasons that you can't really do anything. The oh. uh, best time, I think, is uh, March, April, May. And then you've finished until the fall. I see, I see. So it's it's an involved project. I'm going to go really quickly because yes. I know at the Tripod Gallery you're having a show of Venice yes. photographs. Venice, Italy, yeah. And and these are totally different in color. Yes, um, yes, interesting. Um, we've kept I've kept the colors away like a black and white, but only bring in some tones, as you can see the rope and, and all I'm that, do this uh, San Marco. These are all details of Venice. I don't show the obvious. And um, this last and one. And the, the canal one. and the boat, boat garage. The boat garage. Peter, our time is up. But I want to okay. thank you so much for coming today. Absolutely. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank yeah. you very Enjoy much. It. And keep writing to J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 -N at AOL.com. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.